Oh, hello. It's Ryan. This is our first of two lectures on chapter 22. <clears throat> this will be about alternating current. Alternating current. And the North American power grid. Really, the North American power grid is just an application of alternating current but it's worth talking about because you're all part of it. And so this is chapter 22. And the way I would like to talk about alternating current, um, we've kind of been alluding to alternating current for the last <clears throat> few lectures, especially when we talked about generators and transformers. They both create and need alternating current to function properly. Uh, but chapter 20, uh, so we're going to do our first discussion on alternating, alternating current graphically. And so we're looking at these, and uh, the first thing we want to do is recall what direct current would look like. And you may have never done this before, and you'll see why we never really did this before, and it's mostly because of how... Uh, well, you'll see how self-explanatory it is with direct current. So we have red for current, just like in class. And we'll have blue for voltage. Why not? And so this is our direct current voltage. And our direct current is in red. And so there you have it. This bottom axis will be time and the or the vertical axis will of course be voltage or current depending what you were looking at and we know that this will have to abide by ohm's law and so in this picture it's quite clear that the resistor or the resistance in this whatever is causing this voltage current relationship must be greater than one right so anyway, that is pretty, I guess, obvious. What we really need to look at is what alternating current will look like graphically. And now alternating current, you're more used to it than you realize. It's the current that gets delivered to you from the power company. It's alternating at some frequency and from, and we could just note, in our homes, the current we receive is 60 hertz. So we could say has a frequency of 60 hertz. So in other words, the current coming from your wall socket is oscillating, going one direction and then the other 60 times a second. And this is a unit from physics one uh, hertz, but uh, maybe we could just recall, of course, that one hertz is really just one oscillation per unit time. And in our case, it's a second, of course. Well, for any hertz, it's a second. Okay, so graphically, we could look at, we have our uh, axes. This will be time. And we're going to use the same colors, so we'll use voltage and blue. And I kind of have it cut off the page there. Not very good planning on my part. But imagine, of course, that this comes down like so. And we can add the current into that picture. And so, so maybe right here is just a little off, but that's okay. Uh, when I said that, I meant maybe right here is just a little off. Should have gone down maybe a little lower, but that's okay. The point is 
we have our current, our alternating current, IAC, and we have our alternating voltage, VAC. And of course, uh, actually, we shouldn't call it that. We should give it an, our alternating voltage symbol. So, of course, we know that this still abides by Ohm's law. We know that voltage is always equal to I times R, but in our case, in alternating currents, we give the, the resistance the letter Z. And so later we'll find out that Z has a new name. It's called impedance. But in general, Z is acting as the total total resistance in the circuit. So it's still Ohm's law as you know it. I would be current, and E would be our EMF. But we like to call that voltage. So this is a picture, diagrammatic or graphical representation of alternating current. And there are some important values, and I, I don't want to clutter this picture up, so what I'm going to do is just draw another picture of this. So we're going to go ahead and quickly put down, we're just going to look at a uh, voltage curve. So we're just going to pay mind to a regular sinusoidal wave that represents voltage as a function of time. So this is V as a function of time, and really that would be the label for our axis. So we can just place that That's our voltage as a function of time, and we have our axis would be T. So there are some important values I'd like to show you here instead of deriving them mathematically because nobody really likes to do that, right? Well, I do, but I'm not going to hold my own problems against you. So this right here represents the maximum voltage and then there's a value right around here that represents something called VRMS. Now that RMS stands for root mean squared. VRMS stands for the root mean square voltage. But really, class, what you want to remember this as is, here's for us, VRMS, you just can think of that as the average voltage. Now, the reason we don't call it the average voltage is because if you look at this sinusoidal plot here, if you were to take the average value as a function of time, if you take all of this and add all of this over and over, you end up getting zero, don't you? Yeah, and so we have to apply something called a root mean square, which you would see in some advanced calculus, and that gives us the average uh, value for voltage in another way. It uses the square root of the differentiation of the square and uh, it's a bunch of calculus we don't need. So the way you can remember this RMS value is it's really the average voltage, but mathematicians and physicists listening to this would be shaking their head because they really are different. The point, though, uh, when you're in class or when you're in a lab and you're measuring something with your fluke meters, so your volt meter or ammeters in lab, 
measure RMS values. So when you plug in your voltmeter to the wall, if it reads 120 volts, that 120 volt rating from the power company is really the average, the root mean square value for the, power, or for the voltage you're getting. And so actually the, the peak voltage that you would be getting uh, would be higher than 120 volts. That's something I want to note. Usually this Vmax is usually labeled V peak. So V peak and V max are kind of interchangeable. Okay, so ignoring all the mathematical calculations then, we could quickly give you a few relationships for these root mean square values. We know that for voltage and current, the voltage peak is always equal to root 2 times the voltage RMS value. And the same would be true for current. And again, this comes from some calculus uh, with the square root of the differentiation of the square of the function and all this good stuff. So we're ignoring that, and we're just going to go ahead and remember that this is what we would use to convert RMS values RMS values to peak values or the other way around. So these are important relationships that we'll use for the rest of our discussions on alternating current. Okay. So in general, alternating current is just like it sounds. It's a current that alternates from high to low. And we use that current. We use alternating current because we really like to use transformers in our power grid. And I can show you why. So we're going to go ahead and create the North American power grid below here. And this is going to kind of go in like a box chart. So we'll have the North American power grid. Okay, and like I said before, you're all part of this, so it's worth talking about. And it sheds some light on some stuff that you really need to get by nowadays. So like I said, this is kind of like a flow chart. I don't know if I said that, but I am now. So uh, we're going to start here with, and I'm going to kind of do this in purple. I like that, so. This... is going to be a 14.4 kilovolt generator. So that means that this, wherever it may be, wherever, whatever state or place this may be, uh, is generating 14.4 kilovolts in some amount of time over and over again. And so if you recall from uh, one of my last lectures, when we talked about generators, this generator must be using some sort of uh, Faraday contraption so that it has a changing magnetic flux to generate this, in, this voltage that will then ship out via conductive power lines to a different... Uh, place called a substation. So this is a substation. And really what it is, is it's a step up transformer. So I'm going to write that this is a substation. But what it really is doing is, is it's a step up transformer. And so what it's doing is it's getting this 14.4 kilovolts and it's transforming it to 765 kilovolts. So it's stepping it up. This is going to go on to another uh, substation. 
and we're going to put that substation right here. And this is a 13.8 kilovolt substation. So this would be stepping the voltage down. And so we might note that from here, from here to here, these are probably um, long distance power lines. These are probably long distance power lines. So these are the ones that are really going a long way. From there, we're gonna go to another step down stub station. And so this one's gonna go out to commercial establishments. So this is stepping it down to 480 volts. And so places maybe even like U of M Dearborn, a commercial establishment, will get their power, the voltage is going to come in at 480 volts. And then they'll have their own step-down transformers uh, that they're going to have they're going to basically have almost their own power companies. And if the, so it can either go from here down to here, be stepped down to the 480 volts, and that gets distributed to commercial establishments where they deal with it. Or it can get brought down to a different step-down transformer. And that one will go out in two ways. So one avenue will be stepped down to 240 volts, and one will be stepped down to 120 volts. Those should sound familiar. And of course, those are going to go out to residential establishments. residential establishments like your house. Uh, so this is a step-down transformer, and it's stepping the 13.8 kilovolts down to 120 or 240. Uh, so there are some lines in your house that may be ranked or set to 240 volts instead of the 120. Oftentimes dryers or um, stoves will run at 240 volts, uh, and then a lot of, most of your other things run at 120. Um, all of this is alternating, meaning it all is, is being distributed at 60 hertz. So this in general is a pretty simplified version of our of the North American power grid, but as simplified as it may be, it does a pretty good job, uh, and I'd like to explain a little bit more about it. So I shrank this down a little bit, kind of like magic, just happened on your screen. But anyway, uh, I want to talk you through this, and normally we would do this in class, and you'd be typing away on your calculators to help me figure this out, but we can't because we don't have that ability right now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, suppose that it's a fine summer's day and you're pulling 40 amps from the power company. So that's a lot of current. Uh, so we're going to say, suppose on a fine summer day, you're pulling 40 amps from DTE. You probably get your power from DTE, right? So what I'd like us to end up doing 
Uh, what I'd like us to do, uh, well, we're going to just hold on to that, actually. I'm going to kind of work you through something first. So we're going to hold on to this. And what I'd like to talk you through is why we've stepped up the voltage to such a high voltage here. Um, if you can see, we, we generate at our generator a lot of potential, but we step it way up, um, and then with that high stepped-up voltage, we, we send it across the country or across the state, and then we step it down and send it to the places we need it to go. So the point is, or the question that I would hope that someone would ask is, why so high? Right? Why do we step it up like that? And so in order to figure that out, I have made this supposition here. And we probably won't touch on that for a moment, but bear with me. So what we're going to do is we're going to say this is our primary side. This is our primary side. And this, which is most of what we get in our houses, will be our secondary side. Okay? And we're going to use that to determine some information about uh, the transformations that are going on. So, if we take our V secondary over our V primary, that would be, well, that would be the 120 volts over the 765 kilovolts. But if you recall from one of our previous lectures, that will be equivalent to NS over NP. Um, so maybe we should just note, or we could recall over to the right side here. Don't forget these. We know that VP over NP equals VS over NS. And of course, IPNP equals ISNS. That was from our Transformers lecture. Okay, so if we do this, which we could calculate if you wanted, these zeros would go away, and we could calculate a number. It would be very small. But the reason I want to do this is to really determine what uh, IP is. See, it's this, if this is our primary side over here, if that's our primary, and we're sending this high potential difference to our step-down transformer over very long distance wires, I want to determine what kind of current will be actually through, going through those wires. In general, a high current would be a high power dissipation, and a low current would be a low power dissipation. I guess another thing we could remember from previous uh, lectures would be that the power dissipated uh, is equal to I squared R. Okay, so <clears throat> if we want to get IP, we could use this equation to solve for IP. It would just be IP equals I S n s over n p but we know n s over n p of course is just this so we can calculate i p so we know i p is equal to well if we were given that i s is 40 40 amps times the 12 over 76500. And so IP is equal to, and if you calculate this out, you'll end up getting 6.27 milliamps. That's, of course, 0 0.00627 amps. But if you were to take 
this very small number and plug it into here, the resistance of those wires wouldn't be very high. We, chose, we choose the wires based on that kind of premise. We don't want to lose power along the way. So if we step the voltage up excessively high like this, we would step down the current very, very low, and so we would dissipate much less power when we send the current long distances. And so that's kind of the idea behind this very high voltage when we start, only to step it down and step it down to get this very low voltage for our house. It's really to, not, to try to not lose so much power. So that's it for the North American power grid. It's kind of fun to think about that really we're all part of the power grid. All of these lines must have current moving through them, but remember current is really just moving charges and moving charges create magnetic fields and magnetic fields propagate to infinity. And so as you walk around or live in your living room or use anything connected to power, you know that you're just creating more and more electromagnetic fields, being part of those fields, and propagating them into the universe. It's kind of a lot to take in. Luckily, we only see a very small portion, but I'm getting into our next lectures. This was a longer lecture, so thanks for dealing with it. We'll finish Chapter 22 in a shorter lecture on the next one, and we'll have a couple examples for the next one.